recorded live from the mats of Radical MMA in New York City, the Martial Culture Podcast. Your source for in-depth combat sports and martial arts insights with, with Coach, Coach Rene Dreyfus and, and Matt Peters. Peters. Ring the bell and let's get, get it, it on. on. Welcome back to another episode of Martial Culture Podcast. Uh, we've been gone for a while. There's been a lot of things happening in the news if you haven't uh, heard about all this stuff. Uh, where you been? What side of the moon do you live on? Um, and we are trying to get back into the swing of things as New York City reopens and business, not as usual, but business nevertheless. Renee, how are you? I'm uh, hanging in there. Uh, it is really amazing to be doing the back to the podcast. You know, NYC was closed, so we couldn't couldn't get to my academy, couldn't get to the podcast studio. But I'm glad that we find a way to call in and also address the momentous um, events that are happening and you know I'd like to start a, a series of uh, of casts uh, where we have voices to of African American martial artists and today I'm really really happy and honored to share the program with doc, Dr. Earl Chambers who is a first of all a tremendous personal friend uh, a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt um, also a capoeirista and for many many years and uh, uh, a, a, a leading epidemiologist, so of course he could, of course, talk about COVID and things like that too. But we're going to talk about something a little bit more, uh, I think, uh, pressing. And um, but nice to have you on, uh, Doctor Doctor Earl. It's to you, and uh, just uh, just in a short, um, give us a, a tiny bit about yourself. Where are you from? I know right now you live in New York, but you're originally not from here. And uh, where 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 where'd you, where are you from, buddy? Right. Oh, well, first, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is a great honor. Um, I've been trying to, you know, get on the show for a little while. And I know we've, we haven't sort of connected on it, but I'm glad that we're able to do it now. So I appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, like you said, I'm, I'm, from, uh, I'm from Maryland. That's where I grew up, right outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, went to high school in D.C. Um, and then, um, you know, moved around to school after that and kind of landed in New York um, around 2003 or so, and which is sort of the beginnings of my, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu martial arts career. Um, you know, like you said before, I trained uh, capoeira for a while, and it kind of it's kind of what led me into sort of the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu space. Um, so I've been doing um, Jiu-Jitsu now since since then. So uh, you know, that's what kind of like how I landed here. To- yeah, what was your draw to martial arts? I know we've discussed this a little bit, but uh, I know you've had an interest in martial arts for a long time. But you know, how, is, is martial arts? I know it's a huge part of your life. What was your draw, and and why, and 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 what led you to to training? I see. Like, I mean, I, I guess like every kid who grew up like in the eighties, right? I mean, I I have. I mean, you know, martial arts and and sort of that. Um, that whole like genre of cinema is something that I grew up with. So always loved, loved being a part of it, but I didn't really start training until, um, until I was, I was like, well, in my twenties. So, you know, as a kid, I never really, I never was really able to do it, but you know, as I got older, you know, I was, I was able to connect with it. Um, and it was largely through capoeira initially. And that was like, uh, you know, uh, the beginning of a very sort of like a learning experience for me and just, you know, how I wanted to connect to martial arts and why I started doing it. And for me, it was more like, a, um, you know, I just, I just needed, I needed a, I needed something that, that was able to sort of push me physically with, you know, identify goals that I could, I could, I could sort of achieve a little bit at a time. And uh, it just was a good pairing with, you know, my other sort of academic pursuits. So it's sort of pushing my mind, pushing my body in ways that were like very sort of synergistic. So yeah, absolutely. Can you tell us about your academic achievements, your where you went to school and college, and and your career as an epidemiologist? Yeah. Okay. So I um, let's see. I guess I went to I was in high school in D.C. Um, and then after that, I um, I went to undergrad at Duke University in North Carolina. Um, so spent spent some time down there, and then from there I went on to my master's degree in public health at the University of uh, Illinois, Chicago. Uh, so I spent a couple of years in Chicago. And then after that, to do my PhD at the University of Pittsburgh. And after I spent about four and a half or five years there, um, I 
I came to New York. That was sort of for my postdoc fellowship. And the plan was not to stay in New York, but, you know, get married and then kids later, and then here I am. So, And, and the focus of your research is, is very much in the African-American experience and community and, and public health for that underserved community. Um, do you want to speak about that at all? or? Right. Yeah, so I, mean, I guess my, my journey in public health has, has really landed me in um, – in sort of this chronic disease, diabetes and heart disease space, which, you know, just the, um, there's just more of it in, in our underserved populations, um, black communities and, and low income communities. And so um, it's been part of, of what I've been doing since I've been, since I've been in, in public health. So, and I continue to do it now. Um, it's, it's always been part of, you know, what I considered my, um, you know, my sort of calling, I guess, to do is sort of, examine those kinds of disparities in, in, in those kinds of populations. So so my work is sort of centered around around that. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, yeah. Can I ask you a question? You've lived in a lot of different parts of the United States, south of the Mason-Dixon line, Chicago, yeah. New York, uh, Pittsburgh, places that are very, very different culturally. Um, what Can you speak to that experience and that culture and what it was like to – um, be a be a, a, a black man in in these cities. Is there is it difference? Is it all the same? I mean, it's a, it's a hard question to answer. But particularly your relationship yeah. to uh, uh, law enforcement issues and and you know, have you experienced more harassment, less harassment, or none, or anything like that? Yeah. Oh man. Let's see. Yeah. So I um, so I, like I said, I, I grew up in Maryland. So my 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 parents are not from the United States, right? So I'm like first generation um, immigrant. My parents are from the Caribbean. And, you know, I grew up, I guess, technically south of Mason Dixon, like Maryland, but, but not until I moved to North Carolina was I sort of, my eyes opened to kind of just what it's like to be in the south. And so that was sort of my first sort of experience with, with being, um, being down south. And, um, and it, was, it was a bit of a, of a shock for me because it, it, things can be very, um, you know, very black and white, you know, down, uh, down South. And, and I was not sort of used to that. Um, and then moving to Chicago, it was, you know, very urban, more urban than where I grew up. So it was another kind of like, you know, change, but they have a very, you know, uh, very long sort of African-American tradition there. And, and I learned, uh, you know, a ton of stuff at, from both places, really from just that North Carolina and that experience with down South. And then, and then in Chicago, it was it was um, it was very eye opening for me. Considering you know my my family, like we when I was where I, how I was raised, it was it was very different, you know. Um, so, but you said you asked and, about my experience and, with law enforcement. Yeah. 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 Sure. I mean, whatever you'd like to talk about. Yeah. No. I mean, um, I think uh, you know. Yeah. I, I I I didn't grow up kind of having. Um, my parents didn't talk a lot about you know, law enforcement and what I could expect and those kinds of things. And it was, so it was, it was shocking when you first sort of have those kinds of interactions with police and, and none of them are really that great. Um, and, you know, so it's been, it's been sort of a, um, a, a, a lifelong kind of like learning process in, in dealing with those kinds of things. I mean, as a, as a kid, it's hard to process. First ex- yeah. What was your first experience in, in Chapel? I, it's Duke is Chapel Hill, correct? In, in that area? Durham, of Durham, right? Sorry, thank you. Is it, was, yeah. it, was it that yeah. was your first negative experience, or first where you felt you were profiled, or is, is, is that was that was the first one, or was it younger? No, I was younger. I, I think I'm trying to think of like my first. I, I would say that my first experience with profiling was probably that I can remember is I want to say junior high school maybe. Um, so my father, uh, he he was a he's a dentist, right? So he he um he worked he worked in this sort of um like I guess like a shopping plaza that's where his office was and you know for the summertime my brother and I would just spend time you know all day in the office and then we would go down to like the convenience store to just to buy um you know I don't know candy and stuff from from the store and so at this point you know I remember him sending us down there us going to the store and the lady in the store suggesting that my brother and I were stealing candy. And so I remember going upstairs and sort of telling my father, and he's asking, well, where's the stuff that you bought? And he said, we didn't get it because he got accused of stealing it and the lady um, like kicked us out of the store. And 
and then he, and my, my dad was, he was he's very angry obviously and so went downstairs and sort of made a huge scene and i remember being like totally embarrassed yeah and the, and the, although although we hadn't done anything wrong right because we weren't stealing you know so yeah it was that was sort of my first and at the time i didn't really know what it was um, it's only like later on that i sort of you know as as more and more of those things happen to you and you sort of are able to to see a pattern then you then you start to see that well that's that's not really about me that's not something that i've done um so that was sort of my first time and then after that you know there's a number of experiences after that um similar to that where you know you're being you know watched in stores or profiled for some um you know for what you're doing or what you're wearing or who you're with and all those kinds of things <clears throat> Um, did you ever feel um, your life was uh, threatened in some way? Like you could be in a situation where um, where your interaction could lead to death? Uh, let's see. I guess, I mean, I've never, I've, I, I wasn't until I was older. Um, so that's sort of maybe college age, I guess. Um, you know, you're, I guess, technically an adult for some, and where, where you're, you're interacting with the police and it gets physical in a way where you're like, okay, this could end badly. And that happened to me like maybe a couple times. Um, and in those moments, you're not, you're not sure exactly how to process them. And so, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't having like altercation with the police on a regular basis by any means. So it was just a very sort of a uh, strange space to be in. And then you're thinking to yourself, well, this is, this is, seems to be escalating, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and so that's, that's, that's sort of been my experience with it. If you're comfortable, would you mind describing, if you're comfortable, and this is, you know, your, your truth and what you'd like to speak, would you mind to speak yeah. to one of those examples? Where you, if you remember it, you know, like how it escalated and how you felt? Let's see. I remember, um, I remember once, let's see. Um, let me think. I, it's it's been it's been a long time now, so I'm trying to. And I will say this: that a, a lot of I spent a lot of time just trying to move past those moments, and so it's it's it gets to be like very difficult to like recall them. Um, but I do remember sort of um, you know driving home from North Carolina once. Uh, this is when I was uh, you know um, in in college, and I was driving home back to Maryland from North Carolina and it was late at night and I remember getting pulled over by, I, I, I can't remember if it was local law enforcement or a state trooper, but it was on the highway. So it's probably a state trooper. And, um, and him requiring me to get out of the car. And so that was the first time that I've been asked to like get out of a car. And so in that moment I was saying, and there's nobody there. So it's, just, I'm, I'm, I'm by myself. So, then I'm thinking, and I'm and I'm also in the South, right? So I was, were you I wasn't sure exactly or anything like that, or do you know the reason he pulled you over? Well, he said he said he said it was because of a uh, of a um, a broken tail light. So was one of my tail lights was out. Oh. It pro- it was out, you know. It wasn't you know it wasn't functioning. So which I didn't know, but at the time it was kind of. I mean, it, it ended in a very sort of. Um, can you get out of the car? I'm like, okay. And then he's just checking the car, right? So he searches it and he's not asking me, he's just doing it. And then everything seems to be fine. And he's like, okay, uh, get your tail light fixed. And then I'm on my way. And I'm thinking, and so in that moment I was thinking, one, I don't know my rights at all. And and then two, it's like, you know, if something happens to me out here, I would, no one would ever know. Right. And, um, but, but in terms of like, um, that, that situation, it, it ended, it ended in a, in a, in a positive way, but you still felt yeah. that he, he did not respect your rights or, or, uh, right. and, and asked you more than what he would have normally. That's, that's what, am I correct in processing that? Feeling? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but of course, at the time, I, had, I, I, didn't, I didn't know any of that. You know, right. Sort of, you, you just, I mean, you're like, okay, well, I, I'm not sure why I'm being pulled over, and he tells me why, and it's like, but that doesn't explain why the, the car is being searched at this point. So that's all. Um, 
unclear to me, and I still don't know, you know, what the reason for that was. Um, and there have been other times where I've, I've, you know, been with friends, and so this is kind of like, you know, you're out, you're partying, and then you have altercations with the, uh, with the police because, you know, you have, you're, you're, you're probably with people that are, you know, creating a lot of, um, you know, a drama, but it's, it's, but everybody is, so it's just, you know, that kind of normal interactions um, with the police where you think they're being a little bit more, um, a little bit more aggressive with you than they probably need to. But again, I mean, that was like, you know, a long time ago when I was young, when I was, when I was younger. But did you, did you feel um, in terms of like, that was in, in college, I'm assuming in, in Duke, yeah, or between between the college, uh, it would be it's between college and high school. So it, it's probably, I mean, high school and college. So and times when I was back at home, so I could have been in DC at the time. Um, so most most of it was was in in DC. Yeah. Um, and do you do you feel a protect? Did you feel protective or adversarial relationship or a threatening relationship with law enforcement or how do you process your your relationship to law enforcement in general then and, and now? Oh, yeah. So let's see. It's always been adversarial. Uh, I haven't had sort of positive interactions with the police. And and you have friends, right? So you hear stories from them about things that have happened with the police. So you just, you're just like very cautious and, um, and suspicious all the time. Um, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a, uh, a very normal, you know, perspective, you know, for, for the friends of mine, you know, most of us black and, and, and Hispanic sort of, you know, growing up, it was, you know, the, it wasn't, it wasn't the kind of relationship where, um, where you felt like they were, the police were necessarily protective. Right. Um, can I ask you a question? What was your experience in say Chicago and, and, and New York? Did you feel it was uh, more positive than living in the South or less or, different in any way i know chicago has its issues with law enforcement and of course new york as well yeah i mean at that time you know by the time i i was i was in those spaces i was i was i was older so you know my my interactions with the police were were far less than when i was younger um so and even by the time i got to new york you know I'm just, I'm just at, at that point, you're kind of like an observer at that point, you know, so I can, I can see what they're doing with other people, but I'm not engaged with them that much anymore, you know? So, um, I can't even think of in New York, I haven't had many experiences with the, uh, with the police at all. But, but again, I mean, I'm, I, I, I don't spend a whole lot, of, I, mean, I don't spend a, time, a lot of time out and about. So it's kind of like, um, yeah. a different experience. I mean, you're either in your lab doing time. research or you're, you're, you're in your yeah. training <laughs> or you're with your kids. Uh, yeah. I'm in the academy or with the kids or with, you know, with my wife. So it's a different, you know, it's a different sort of, um, it's a different sort of perspective for me, but I mean, I still, I still pay attention. And because, you know, a lot of what I do is really being sensitive to these kinds of issues. And, and, um, then I, I, I can see it, you know, um, it's just not as it's just not happening to me quite quite as much as it did when I was younger. How about um, your your two sons? Um, ha- have you spoken with them and these issues? I know they're they're approaching their one is approaching his teen years now. Yeah, yeah, he's almost thirteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We um so we talked. I mean, we're you know we're living in in sort of these times, and and my wife and I we've always been kind of you know um, very sort of. Um, del- deliberate about teaching the boys about you know just social social issues in general and being involved and so um, so they're they're they have sort of a a pretty good I guess working knowledge of what the issues are around um, around a number of things I mean whether it's uh, you know what we're seeing with with COVID nineteen right now and how it's sort of disproportionately affecting uh, communities of color or you know, police and sort of their interactions with people of color, um, issues around like climate change and how, um, you know, there are communities of color that are sort of more negatively influenced by those kinds of changes that happen when, you know, you have huge storms or heat waves or all, I mean, and they're all, they're all connected, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's being able to sort of acknowledge or like see the patterns in, um, in, in how, and how all of these are related. So the boys yeah, I mean, are, you know, 
we spent time with that. Wow, that's wonderful. I mean, all these are this, you know, there's a, a, a large level of intersectionality to all the social problems we face. And predominantly, whatever social problem that you want to look at, it hits uh, people of color and the African American community within people of color, that demographic, I think, even harder than almost anyone else, Native Americans, African Americans. But, um, sure. but let me not interrupt you. Um, um, so uh, let's move on to the, would you mind me? asking what your experience is in uh, how you you saw the Black Lives Matter, Matter movement or Colin Kaepernick's kneeling before the George Floyd murder and then the what's going on in the last, you know, three weeks and, and, and how you how you view it and how you view um, that, you know, that that in, in general. Yeah. So let me see. I'll start with um I'll start with Colin Kaepernick only because, like my, um, you know, my my son recently, the, my younger one, he's ten, and he recently sort of did this report on um, on Colin Kaepernick, which I thought was great because um, he chose him. So you know, it's kind of like choose a sports figure that has changed the sport that they that they you know that they play, and he felt like Colin Kaepernick was the one that he wanted to choose, mm-hmm. and and I was like, okay, what, why is that? And then so so it's just. Um, you know, it's fresh on my mind. So I, I think the, the the way that I'll sort of come around to answering your question is just, um, you know, it's uh, it, it's important to at least for me to use like your platform to to make the kind of changes that you'd like to see, right? So for the boys, it's just about trying to encourage them to be as active as they can be and trying to you know, you know address these kinds of social issues, um, and you know. The, the way I feel about Colin Kaepernick is, is, is that, you know, he's trying to, he's trying to use his platform to, to do something that he feels is important. And it comes, it came with a consequence for him. It came at a, a huge cost for him. Um, and, you know, I've always been sort of supportive of, of him using his voice in that way. Um, and, you know, I, I think at the time, I, I'm sure for him, it must have been, very difficult to, you know, sort of, you know, put your livelihood on the line, right. For this, for this cause. And, and, and it's, it's bearing out, you know, so now we're starting, you know, it, it is, it's an issue. And I think, you know, we're getting a lot of momentum behind, behind this now, but, you know, the black lives matter movement was really sort of um, started around sort of police brutality, but it's really expanded quite a bit to really address all of the all the issues that we talked about so it's not just about you know police brutality it's about it's about just sort of the structural racism in general uh, right. and, and it touches it touches everything yeah. and it's interesting that Kwame Ture otherwise known as Stokely Carmichael came up with the concept of structural racism you know to systemic racism and you know all through the 60s and and beyond he was one of the most vilified uh, African American leaders around and, um, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, but that it doesn't, it, and it's, you know, it's been, that concept has been, um, roundly, you know, uh, 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 uh what's what I'm looking for, uh, defamed, you know, by the, by people yeah. who are from the more conservative set, but we can see with, um, redlining, with the destruction of black communities, with, um, uh, disproportionate, you know, levels of health care that there there is a, a systemic problem and uh and you know martin luther king saw it and uh and said you right. know the only way we're going to get social justice is if we have economic uh justice as well and unfortunately you know uh, that's when he was assassinated but uh, again let me not interrupt right. you i'm sorry right. so you, you right. said that the, right. no, the, right. um, it's taken its way into every aspect of, of life have you seen it in the martial arts world First hand or second hand or in in dojos that you've trained in. So I, let me see. I guess I, I, I've, I've thought about this, and I think you know. So my my uh, my entry into martial arts, like I described, was sort of capoeira, and and I think what I what I liked about, or at least what resonated with me with capoeira, was that, that it it seemed like it had a um, it had a an African sort of foundation to it, and so and I, and that I, I connected with that, and when I was training, it, it was. Um, it was I was I was living in uh, in Barbados in you know in the Caribbean at the time, and so I was training with 
with some people there and you know it was great it sort of like spoke to you know what i felt like um i could be good at in martial arts and um and i it, i just re- it resonated with me so um so that was sort of my my initiation to it. and then when i was um back in pittsburgh i was that's where i was living at the time um you know i connected with capoeira in that space again and there was always like a a very um uh like it was part of more of like a social movement um, in, in sort of the schools that I was a part of. It, they really had a community sort of aspect to it that I, that I enjoyed. And when I got into jujitsu, um, you know, most of those, most of those, most of the places or when I was training, very few people of color, uh, well, I should say very few black people. Um, and to me, you know, it's, it's just a, you know, a, a, I take note of those things and, 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 and think to myself, well, why, why is, why is that? It's not, you know, there are plenty of people who, um, you know, who enjoy sort of martial arts and, and would like to train. And I, I always wonder sort of why, why are we not seeing them in these spaces? Um, and so, and that, and that's been sort of a typical experience of mine with, when it comes to just training, um, training martial arts in general. Would you say that the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu community was a little bit more, um, what's the word, um, not responsive to issues of color? Like, you know, I know there's there's always the, yeah. the, the dojo after the training talk. And would you say that you felt, um, I don't want to use the term microaggressions, but like a lack of understanding for your perspective in, in some of the places you trained? Uh, I wouldn't say that it was like a, uh, that wasn't, a, that's not the kind of conversations that I have there so that way. Right. So it was like, you know, you're there for sort of the training and, and I, I just, I left it at that. And so, but I noticed, I noticed that I'm the only one. So, and that's not, that's, that's typical for the spaces that I'm in these days. Right. So it's kind of like, you know, whether I'm at work or in my academic space, it's like that too. But you know, it, those, those kinds of, um, of places to me, they, the, the question that I always ask myself is like, what is it about this place that is, that is not lending itself or not open or not being open to, to having a more sort of diverse, you know, um, you know, participation. So, yeah. 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 Um, and, and it's, oftentimes I mean, you, it's just, you, you see it as more of a, 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 a white space or a less welcoming space maybe. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so it's, it's kind of like, um, yeah. So, and, 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 you know, it's like anything else. It's like, you know, you, 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 you just wonder like what, what, who's not being included. Right. So that's, that's sort of how I, how I view it. Right. Um, thank you for that. And, um, uh, yeah. going back to the, um, Oh, do you have anything to add? Um, Matt? No, no, I'm good. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, going back to like BLM and, and the murder of George Floyd, I'd like to get your take and, and how, how, uh, how you're processing it. Oh, let's see. I, I, um, I, I don't watch those videos anymore. I mean, the, so, the whole issue, not that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I say that's cause I want to, I, I guess the, 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 the the way I process it is uh, is trying to um, focus on you know the kinds of um, the kinds of changes that I'm making to sort of prioritize um, you know addressing those structural sort of the structural racism that we talked about. So you know George Floyd is like is one in a series, right? So I remember taking my boys. Um, to protest when um, when Eric Garner was killed, and and it was just like okay, and again and and you know now it's sort of, it's George Floyd and you know you have to figure out how much bandwidth you have to kind of you know take all this stuff in, and so it's been like very difficult to really try to think through it. And, and now that the boys are older, it's sort of even harder because you have to try and explain this. Um, and really all you can do is, is try to give them the tools to better process the anger. And, 
And so that's kind of like been my focus, you know, as of late. It's kind of like sitting in the space where you feel, okay, um, here we are again. And then you're trying to move forward. And then really, you know, are you going to, if you're going to get to focus your energy on things that matter. And so for me, it's about how do you dismantle sort of these racist infrastructures or, or the structural racism that continue to produce this outcome, right? So that's what I do. How, um, how do you see your kids reacting um, to the murder, to the protest? And have you, you know, and, and how are you as a father dealing with it, uh, you know, in, in terms of consoling them or however? Yeah, I think, um, you know, they're still, they're still kind of young, but I, I, but they're not, they're, they're exposed to it all. So it's kind of, um, you know, my, uh, my younger one, he's 10, he's almost 11 actually. And he is sort of, he's more of a, we need to be where the action is kind of person, you know? His whole thing is like, we should be going to these protests. We should be getting involved in that way. Um, and my older one is a little more like fearful of those spaces in a way. And his thing is, um, you know, he tries, he, he just wants to, he, like, he likes to write more about it. So um, discussions about it, talks more about it, tries to get himself to a place where he can, you know, understand and then articulate about it. So that's kind of, you know, they they have different approaches, but for me, the, the, the biggest thing for me is to try to figure out, um, or at least give them the tools that this express to me, like how they're feeling, you know, like, what do you, what do you take? What do you take from all this? You know, how are you processing it? Does it matter to you? Does it not? Um, if it does in what ways? And, and, um, and, and so if you sort of get them sort of talking and, 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 and it's, it's, you know, everybody's at home now, right? So we're on this kind of huge, you know, COVID-19 pause. And so they don't get to socialize with their friends in the way that they did before. They're not able to sort of interact with them and, um, and you know, talk with them about these kinds of things and see how their friends are responding and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's got to be hard for them to figure out how to process it all. Can I ask a question? I mean, you guys live in Harlem and, um, Right. Um, where, where, where you We're in Washington Heights. Harlem. I live in Washington Heights. Oh, Washington, sorry, Washington Heights. Right. Um, yeah, the yeah. school that they go to is um, um, a, a school that is uh, very multi, multi, you know, cultural, multi ethnic. Do, do they? Yeah. Do, do you see though, even even so, some systemic sort of inequality? You know, some some things different in, in the way they they're achieving their they're they're experiencing education, or, or there's times where you have to say, hey, you know, hey, this is what it says here, but actually, this is this. You know, um, yeah. there's something. Uh, my, my, father, we've like, been very addresses. Yeah, we've been very. Um, you know, my both, both the kids go to public school, and we've been of, you know, very deliberate about trying to find ones that align with our ideals in that way. And so um, they both go to go to pretty diverse um, public schools. Um, so that that was sort of a, a conscious decision on our part um, to try to give them a, a broader kind of experience in that way. Um, so, yeah, so for us, it's been, you know, we we think that you know, there are, are many opportunities in New York City um, to try and do that. I mean, not everybody's able to, but but we're fortunate. So we can kind of, you know, spend time trying to figure out, you know, where the best places to try to send them um, and, and and work within sort of the, the New York City kind of public school system to try to try to do the best by them. And I know, you know, I, 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 of course, we're friends on Facebook, and I know you guys recently took some trips, and there was a, a very much, um, uh, it seemed like it wasn't just a trip, it was like a learning experience of experiencing, you know, African-American culture, and, uh, and, and it wasn't them to, to, to that. I remember you went to New Orleans, and, uh, and I was like, yeah. wow, this is, this is a very active parent who's really trying to create a, <laughs> a, 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 a son who sees him, himself as black in such an incredibly positive way. Yeah, we, I mean, we travel, we travel a lot with the boys. So um, again, we're 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 fortunate to be able to do that. And so, um, and there are plenty. I mean, we 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 go to New Orleans quite a quite a bit, and it's some it's a place that my wife and I both sort of really enjoy. And um, 
and and the boys too, you know. So we we go there as often as we can, um, and then yeah, and to try to connect them to sort of that that sort of southern um, you know that southern experience, and so which is it's it's very different than New York. Uh, so no, they all they know is New York. So to them, you know, it's busy and there's people around all the time. Like that's sort of their normal. Um, so yeah, we 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 like to sort of give them. Um, you know, broad, broader experiences. And, 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 and it doesn't really, I mean, New Orleans is just sort of one of those places, but, you know, in the U.S., you can, you, can, you can go so many different places and see so many different things. So, Yeah, that's fantastic. But um, that's great. I just, I just, I think it must be difficult being a, a, a parent in these times. And so I just wanted to touch on that. But um, and and how yeah. you how you talk about it with your kids, you know, um, I I, uh, I know uh, uh, some people who who you know their, their kids have been really traumatized by, by by watching this. But also, it seems like your youngest that your kids are very empowered too by the by the movement that's happened for the last three weeks. And and how do you see this movement? At one one thing, I saw a graph that said today that the opinion of Black Lives Matter in 2018 was uh, a highly negative. By 2019, it was uh, like 50% of the population thought it was positive, and right now it's it's you know shooting past 75%. So we're at a at a you know sort of like a sea change uh, at least you know in terms of attitudes towards uh, towards the movement for you know social justice. And um, and what what are your what are your thoughts of, on the past the, the 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 demonstrations, the the backlash against the rioting or you know, uh, you know, however, whatever you'd like to speak to and, you know, in, in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I am, you know, <laughs> I am, I am all for sort of using, using your voice to, um, to affect change. And so, and I tell the boys that all the time and, and, you know, so the, the protest is what it is. And, and, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, its purpose is to be, is to, is to agitate and to be sort of disruptive of what you consider to be um, a situation or a circumstance that's no longer tolerable. So I, you know, the, the, the backlash to me is, is, is what, what protests are in, sort of designed to do. Um, so, and I, I can see, like, I mean, like you said, there's sort of, there seems to be this, this big, this sort of sea change where um, you start to see more and more people in support of, of, the, of this sort of movement that's been going on for quite a while now. And, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's the right thing to do. And, and so for me, it's, especially when it comes to just the boys, is that they need to, they need to figure out how they're going to contribute and then get to doing that. And there's many ways you can do that. So I just, I just try to give them, you know, show them my options and you choose how you're going to, how you're going to engage, but you got to do something. Right. Right. Um, what, what do you see as important in terms of reformation of, you know, how we just just spoke of specific, specific, yeah, specifically on use of force and, um, the interaction of law enforcement to, you know, people of color, particularly African-Americans. I mean, do you see what is what is what are some changes that you think are essential, particularly from the from the view of a martial artist? Yeah, I mean, you know, we you and I have talked about this before, and it's kind of um, it's you know, I my my whole sort of take on sort of the you know the the police is is that you know we need to figure out a different way to get what we need from our law enforcement. So what's, what's happening now is not working. Um, it's not working for, for, for the black communities. And so we need to figure out something else. And so, you know, you and I talk about it, sort of excessive force and what it would take. And, you know, is it about training or not training? Or maybe if this police officer had some, some training, he could do better at this or he, you know, wouldn't, it, it wouldn't lead to that. And, you know, I, I mean, you know more about that than I do, but, you know, it's, it's really not about that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's about the fact that, you know, there, um, there's something about, about, you know, the, um, the accepted use of force 
and lack of sort of repercussions that is fundamentally problematic. Um, but, you know, you and I talk about this all the time. I mean, you, you sort of, uh, you know more about this. I mean, you sort of run, you know, a martial arts school and you, you kind of train the self-defense um, all the time. So, I mean, well, come on, you are a Brazilian just a black belt, Earl. <laughs> you know, yeah, you've been mad yeah. Too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's, but you're it's, you know, it's funny. It's like, uh, I, and I, and I, and I, and I, I see, I see sort of like all of this conversations around, you know, how they should, how police should be trained better. And that's, that seems to be like the, it seems to me to be a common refrain from sort of the martial arts community. So I, I, and I don't, that's just like my, what I, what I've, what I've seen. Um, And what, I mean, do you see that same thing? I mean, is that, is that, is that more, most oftentimes the kind of like where, where this whole conversation goes, it's like, we should be training. uh, Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It it's always comes down to, oh, it was one bad apple, and if or he was untrained, he wasn't properly trained. And that is, right. I think, a, a gross and severe and criminal mischaracterization of the, of the argument. That being said, absolutely almost every single police officer, law enforcement officer, I should say, and security personnel that I've ever dealt with, was severely undertrained. Um, uh, mm-hmm. But that is a totally different issue. You know, um, when, yeah. you know, just going on the Eric Garner issue and I'll let you talk cause this is your turn, but you know, yeah. b- b- police, you know, carotid and tracheal restraints, you know, basically for the lay person, a choke, um, have not been part of a use of force paradigm in New York city police officers since I believe the 1983 or something like that. I forgot the exact year. And, mm-hmm. uh, so they're really, unless you're in an absolute life threatening scenario, you should not be deploying a carotid or tracheal restraint. And, uh, yeah. um, and it's happened, uh, there's been a tremendous number of, not just Eric Garner, go all the way back to a, a number of uh, officers have, without repercussions, used tracheal and carotid restraints and uh, led to the death of, of, of the, the, um, the suspect and, um, and without any, any you know, serious re- repercussions. So uh, it's... Yeah. it's um, yeah you know, not, not an issue of, of just what the regulations are, even though just yesterday they changed it and they said, now it's a crime for, it is a crime for not just regulation, but it's a crime now for a police officer to use a carotid or tracheal restraint. But, you know, what if he uses again, it goes to trial and he's not guilty, you know, like that, right. that's, that's, that's what's basically happened. And, um, it's, it's something more, you know, why, why, um, why are you choking someone when you don't, you know, I, I just saw uh, a, a video of a armed Caucasian um, demonstrator reaching for his pistol, reaching for his pistol yeah. to withdraw, to deploy that pistol. And a white police officer putting his hand up and go calm down. <laughs> right. <laughs> You're black and you fucking right. dead. <laughs> right. 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 Anyway, but, but uh, that's right, you know, right. And and uh, and there's so many instances to, to, of evidence to back up that. But anyway, I'm gonna be quiet. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and yeah, please, no, you okay. you say your piece. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, I um, it it seems to me like we we have to we have to be doing something different. And so, um. You know, and and it's not just like I said, it's not just about you know, it's not just about training because there's a there is a pattern of excessive force uh, when it comes to you know to to black communities and to the populations and populations of color. So it's there is a there's an ability to use restraint in certain in in other you know in other populations and other communities, but not not so much when it comes to like black and brown people. So. Um, it's it's a it's a real problem. So so what's happening now? I think with sort of you know the protests in cities, not just even in the United States, but just you know in in other countries across the globe, you know, really sort of this it's there's um, you know this huge sort of movement right now to to really try and spend more time addressing these kinds of like structural problems. Um, so it's good. I mean, it's it, it it connects us, I guess, in a way um, across across sort of um, our you know, country boundaries um, and to a larger sort of recognition that 
these kinds of um, of of structural sort of structural racism is 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 really um, um, something that we should, we need to we need to take on in a more deliberate way because uh, it's costing people their lives. <clears throat> yeah. You know. And I mean, um, uh, Matt, do you have anything also to to ask? Do you want to uh, chime in a little bit? Chime. Um, I did have one question. So, so being a, a man of science and, and in the field that you're in, uh, is is there like a struggle within you with like being part of the protests or encouraging your sons to be out in these uh, these marches? Uh, but also the COVID is still very much present. I know people are taking a lot of precautions, but is there an internal struggle there for you yeah. as a father? Yeah. As well? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, uh, um, we've been sort of, you know, in self sort of, you know, isolation for almost three months now. And, you know, I haven't been to any, any of the protests and, 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 and in large part because I, I've, I've done a lot of protesting, you know, just in my life in general, but, but, um, but yeah, around, you know, exposing COVID is still here and, you know, we are seeing a, um, you know, an opening up of New York city, which to me is going to really end up costing us. I think, you know, COVID is, is, is still here. The, you know, being in sort of these, these spaces so close together, it is definitely something that I'm thinking about um, and really, you know, trying to, to balance, you know, whether what the what the risks are. So, for sure, that's a that's a big consideration for me. Wow. Yeah. No. For sure. And I mean, um, I would say that sometimes change is explosive and uncontrollable, and it just happens in ways that are like I mean, this movement is completely spontaneous, and uh, as was you know the you know Boston Tea Party. You know, it's this kind of these spontaneous explosions yeah. of we've had enough. And you can't really yeah. predict the time or when they're going to happen. You know, life is sometimes inconvenient, and uh, yeah. and uh, yeah. it just it just was a, a time that we, as a community, and uh, and I mean, some people listen to this don't know I'm I'm not African American, I'm but I'm a person of color, uh, uh, and I do have people who uh, who are non-white skin, who are very close to my family, and victims of of violence and at, at the hands of law enforcement. Um, so, you know, there's a explosion of this frustration now. Um, and, uh, it just, it's what it is. It's an emotional explosion, which is, you know, just enough is enough. It may be inconvenient time for sure. And, uh, hopefully, you know, COVID, it seems like it's, it's being, um, managed a little bit better on the medical front, but of course, um, you know, there, there are these concerns, especially as you as an epidemiologist, I'm sure you could speak to that even more, but, um, yeah. Um, any any final final thoughts um, that you would like to say? I, I think you really touched on things about white spaces. You know that um, that that you know there's a, it's you know martial arts schools can be white spaces, and so there's very little to. I find martial arts schools very often. I mean, even when they're populated by very decent human beings, their lack of understanding of structural um, inequalities is is very glaring because they just don't have that many people expressing those feelings to them. It's not in their community. You know, there's the, so these, these martial arts spaces are very, very, um, uh, what's the word I'm going to homogenous in the way they yeah. view it. Yeah. And I see a lot of them saying, well, you know, I, I agree with black lives matter or they wouldn't generally don't say that. I agree with equality, but, yeah. uh, you know, the riots, the riots, turn me off, you know, like, uh, you know, you, now I don't support yeah. it at all. And I find that, you know, that, that is something I've seen a lot of, um, is this something you want to touch on in, in that sense? Um, or, or if you don't, that's fine yeah. too. You know, I just, however yeah. you want to, yeah. Your own opinion. Uh, I, I guess I would say this about this, uh, my, you know, there's, there's never a shortage of, of, of people who want to tell you how to, how to resist injustice. Right. So, so, and, and, and then the real issue becomes not about the injustice, but about how you plan to respond. So, so to me, it's like, you know, when people say stuff about, well, it's the riots that I can't really get behind, I'm thinking, but the larger issue is the injustice. And, and what has been your take on that? What have you said about that? How have you spoken about that? 
what have you done to sort of address that particular issue? So, so, so that's, that's my, that's my biggest sort of like criticism when I hear people say that. And, um, and for me, like you said, you know, these, um, and within martial arts schools in general, it's that, you know, if, it's not enough to just say, you know, well, I don't discriminate. I mean, there are there are um, there are, are spaces that are welcoming, and there's some and there's spaces that are not. And so, and if you think about, you know, your your um, your school, Renee, I mean, and if and and you know, if you had if 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 all of your students were, were like, you know, just were just uh, you know, um, sort of white males from like, you know. Uh, making like, you know, over $200,000 a year, I mean, that'd be great. But it's, you're like, well, I, I, I wonder, I wonder why that's, why is, why, why are those, are those the only people that are interested in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or interested in martial arts or interested in training or just in MMA? You know, um, it's, it, it's, it's just trying to be a little bit more um, uh, open to the idea that maybe the spaces that you, that you're creating are not, are not welcoming to all, all people. Um, and yeah, and, and I will say, you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu has always, even in Brazil, been associated uh, of, uh, with a upper upper class martial art. It was not the martial art generally of, of the poor people until there were some very very pioneering martial artists who went into the favela to start teaching there. But the Gracies that were always, you know, teaching the politicians, the businessmen, and that, and was considered, uh, you know, an upper-class martial art. And, and to that end, there was, in the older generations, very few people of color from that martial art. And if you actually look at their opponents from Luta Libre or Capoeira, those are mostly people of color. So I think there's a very big dividing line that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu tends to be a little bit elitist and less welcoming of, of, of people of color. That's not to say that, you know, all Brazilian Jiu Jitsu teachers are racist or anything like that. I'm saying no, as a yeah. general as a general trend, it's a space more of of uh, you know, not a space where you see a lot of people of color. Yeah, and I think it just takes me kind of back to my sort of big beginning with sort of martial arts and looking at I mean, Capoeira kind of was was one of those spaces where I felt um that it just had it, it. It was more welcoming, and 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 that's that's just some parts of it. I mean, there are other capoeira spaces that are not that way, um, where really? where it's almost it's almost it's almost like the like the Af, like the the Africanness is is removed in a way. Um, so, you know, it's not always it's not always the case that it that that those sort of capoeira spaces are retaining really the the. Um, and the sort of the, the 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 fundamental sort of roots of of that African experience, like it, it was it was developed in 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 and sort of became kind of what it is in Brazil, but you know it didn't start there. You know it was it was it was brought there. So it's just trying to trying to keep the you know I guess that it's it's starting the story at the beginning. That's what right. I'll say. Yeah. Um, now that's that's fascinating. It's interesting. That my experience in New York, where um, the martial arts and black communities have been very closely intertwined, um, particularly uh, kung fu, the kung fu communities, and and at a certain point in, in the sixties and seventies, the African American community was living very in, very close to a lot of uh, Chinese communities. So those communities bonded, mm. and I know a tremendous number of. African American martial artists who were inspired by you know the old kung fu movies of Bruce Lee, and yeah, yeah. Um, there's a a lot of black American martial art uh, styles created out of that those intermixings Moses Powell Jiu Jitsu, um, Viennese Jiu Jitsu where they're fusions of you know the two different cultures Asian cultures African cultures and they were, seem to be very welcoming but there are also a lot of spaces um, particularly uh, uh, you know sort of more uh, Aikido is, is tends not to be um, it tends to be extremely white space um, um, right. and and and, uh, and the same sometimes Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as well um, and um, so it's it's an interesting problem that we face you know our community is not without those uh, those problems as well um, and it just I think it's yeah. time for everybody to reflect on things that you may not see hey why are there you know 
not so many people? Why there? Why is everybody like me and not different? Or, you know, what, how do we how do we integrate these perspective, different perspectives? I think MMA, you know, is born out of people looking to different things, but we can use that as a metaphor to step out of our our, our bubble of whatever ethnicity we come from and try to understand the perspectives and what people are going through from uh, uh, people of color and particularly the African American experience. Um, and, uh, I want to just, you know, thank you. Um, if you have anything else to say to, to f- f- finish up or Matt, if you have anything else to add, um, but uh, you know, it was awesome talking today. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. This is great. Yeah. It's thanks fun. so much for taking the time out. We appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm hoping we can have you on again and, and just, just talk about more positive uh, things. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank yeah. you so much. <laughs> uh, you are, you're an amazing, you know, not only are you an amazing uh, 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 research scientist, but you're an amazing martial artist and, and more importantly, you're an amazing human being. And I'm, I'm you know, very lucky to, uh, to be training and, and, and know you and have you as a friend. And, um, well, you're um, very kind. And I, you know, I've been friends for a long time now. So, you know, it's <laughs> It's as always it's always great talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Twitter at Marshall underscore culture and on Instagram at Marshall Culture Cast. Please leave a review on iTunes and we'll see you next time on the Marshall Culture Podcast.